science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. Welcome to the Darwin Digest, episode 43. Uh, This week we are touching back on race, but a little bit different this time. Uh, We're going to be discussing, well, for one, we're going to be discussing um, the more meta-race stuff in part. Anyway, um, we'll probably jump into it. Uh, I'll get us us kicked off because I've got two parts this week. I'm going to be discussing clinical medicine, the differences in race with clinical medicine. Anyway, to get us going uh so to begin with like you know i was look you obviously google it and have a look and i noticed that basically every single paper in in the area of race and medical treatment um except for a few that were actual studies uh, began with something to the effect of race is not real and then you know a paragraph later amusingly um it would go into detail about how it's clinically useful so i just thought i'd point that out um and now some of them do have a point where you know there are technically more precise metrics than just race like genotyping think you know sickle cell the black population has more of it than the white population but not every black needs treatment um if you can identify the sickle cell allele then you know that's usually a better it's a better metric than just race so like they kind of have a like they they do have a point there but like the utility of race and this is something they always ignore is how powerful it is relative to the difficulty obtaining it you get a crap ton of utility uh basically by asking a single question um other thing I want to just cover before I jump into data uh, is the um, ex- exactly how race interacts with health in general. And there's two kind of categories, and these are sort of both played to uh, both played by the left to say that it's not really a thing. So I just want to you know uh, make you aware of them. At first, uh, the first I would t- sort of term primary interactions. So these are things with genetic genetic links. Um, the increased rate of hypertension in blacks or the rates of cystic fibrosis in Europeans or Tay-Sachs in Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, the other group are sort of like secondary um, are secondary interactions, which arise from essentially things like living standards each demographic typically finds themselves in. Uh, these issues will typically be significantly reduced or even disappear when things such as IQ or income are controlled for, um, and often there's only a very weak genetic link. Um, in essence, these are issues caused by behaviour such as, you know, unhealthy eating causing obesity, which, yes, there's a genetic component, but, you know, it's majority behaviour. Um, and the second group is easy for liberals to hand wave away. You know, it's just the environment, um, not enough welfare to buy healthy food, for example, all that sort of stuff. Um, there are plenty of debunkings about those individual points, which I'm not going to be going into, but they're all available in our spheres. Um, so just keep that in mind, though, is even these things which are these sort of secondary ones are still based off things like behavior and behavior is determined as you've gone into it you know the uh mao two repeat a uh, three repeat uh, variant is highly uh associated with increases in compulsive gambling behaviors so you know things like that actually have th- these changes in, in behavior are done by genetics so there's sort of like an extra leap as opposed to just going straight into genetics uh, but without that out of the way i'm going to read very heavily from a paper titled genetic factors in ethnic disparities in health is from the National Review uh, National Research Council, U.S. Uh, is it racist? On race. It sounds pretty racist to me. Uh, actually, <laughs> actually, um, you'll be amused in a second with a quote from I have at the very start of this paper. Um, from it's from the National Research Council uh, panel on race, ethnicity, and health in later life. It's written by Richard S. Cooper, who amusingly starts the paper with a quote from an African American communist, W. E. B. Du Bois. Um, the quote is, I, I very early got the idea that I was going, what I was going to do was prove to the world that Negroes were just like other people. <laughs> uh, so you can tell, like, this paper is very, very paused. Um, and I chose this passage to reference um, as it's essentially just a compilation of others, other research. And I picked this paper as opposed to other options I had because it does show the extent of differences between the races that the left are forced to admit to when they want to talk about Gibbs. And they, you know... Uh, <laughs> they uh, forget when they're not. Uh, so anyway, the paper. 
With the availability of vital statistics on both Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, we now have a reasonably clear description of the patterns of common disease in the U.S. racial ethnic group uh, in U.S. racial ethnic groups. Uh, the first and most striking feature is the heterogeneity of, that exists among the groups. The most prevalent notion of minority health status in the United States is built on the quote deficiency model, that is the expectation of poor outcomes for groups other than whites. Uh, so obviously, you know. Um, whitey is doing something to keep everyone down and that's why they're sicker. Uh, dismissed in the past as artifactual, the relative advantage enjoyed by Hispanics, uh, despite similar education and income to blacks, is now undeniable. Uh, characterized as the Hispanic paradox, an active research agenda exists in epidemiology to explain this counterintuitive finding. Uh, Marx and Correll, 1986. Uh, unreported shoebox burials are said to contribute to low infant mortality whilst the healthy migrant effect and the return of sick elderly to the country of origin accounts for low adult uh, mortality. James, 1993, Marx and uh, Coriel in 1986. Uh, a number of cohort studies now document low age-specific death rates in Hispanics, primarily Mexican-Americans, which cannot be ascribed to these biases. Wetel, 1996. Uh, so we, Etel, 1996. Uh, the relative advantage is not universal, however. In many Hispanic communities, obesity and diabetes occur at much greater uh, frequencies than among whites. Uh, health, uh, on the other hand, uh, black Americans suffer higher rates of all of the major causes of death except for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and liver disease. Now, just a note on the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that's um, isochronic or ischemic, how it was said, um, heart disease, which is essentially uh, like things like, things like cholesterol build up and all of that. Um, the uh, risks of heart disease from high, things like hypertension um, are basically a lot higher in blacks and it goes into it for a bit but there is basically these two broad categories of um, heart disease and yeah um, whites have a higher whites have a higher rate of one which is the obstructive pulmonary disease and blacks have a higher rate of the hypertensive pulmonary disease. Uh, the excessive rate of cardiovascular disease uh, has long been recognized as being secondary to the high prevalence of hypertension. As was said. Despite high rates of hypertension, uh, coronary heart disease, heart disease mortality was lower among blacks than whites over the past half century, as it was once widely held that blacks were constitutionally resistant to um, atherosclerosis. Uh, rates of coronary heart disease in blacks now exceed whites, Cooper et al. 2001. Asian Americans experience remarkably lower death rates, particularly from coronary um, vascular disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, sorry. Um, Lau, McGee and Cooper, 1990. Type 2 diabetes has been less common in blacks in the first half of the 20th century. It now occurs twice as often among blacks as whites. Um, Harris et al., 1990. Stamler et al., 1979. Death rates from malignant neoplasms, that's cancer, are highest amongst black Americans. The, blacks, uh, the black excess is found in all the common forms of cancer except for myeloma, uh, which the differences are particularly marked in the younger age groups. Potential genetic influences are given considerable, considerable attention in studies of prostate cancer where blacks have an incidence rate twice that of whites. Lung cancer has attracted less speculation despite black to white mortality ratio being a ratio of 1.0 to 1.4. Uh, overall, blacks smoke less than whites, uh, so the forces of work are you know, a little bit obscure. It's a bit me messed up there. Uh, breast cancer mortality is higher in blacks than whites, and at a younger age, the excess is twofold. Uh, that's pr as an aside, that's probably linked to the, uh, that's probably linked to the fact that uh, blacks reach puberty faster than whites. Uh, the long-awaited downturn in mortality began in 1992 and has been observed only in whites. Uh, known mutations in the uh, BRCA loci amount for a substantial portion of breast cancer cases among women, uh, only among women of Jewish ancestry. Uh, deaths from diabetes and liver disease are higher among Hispanics than whites, although total mortality is lower and life expectancy amongst Hispanics is thought to exceed 80. Uh, that describes uh, that that's because of those forces at work before where they basically um, they don't tell they don't tell the government when their little kid dies and they go back to Mexico to die when they're old um, so obviously that's artificially inflating their um, life expectancy in the United States uh, all cause mortality for uh, Asians is remarkably low only 38% of the rate among blacks. The risk of dying from HIV is 2.4 times higher in Hispanics than whites, but eight times higher in blacks. Uh, 
infant mortality is lower in Hispanics than Asians than whites, but more than twice that, more than twice as high in blacks. The persistently higher rate among blacks is given in large measure by premature, uh, prematurity and low birth weight. Uh, that's Kleinman and Kessel, 1987. The prevalence of diabetes uh, is currently 14% among Mexican Americans, uh, 12% among blacks, and 7% among whites. Oh, this is a, um, just as an aside, this is a study from 2004, so this is a decade, a little over a decade ago. In general, other measures of health status are consistent with this overall picture. Self-reported health is rated lowest by blacks and Native Americans, uh, order, uh, followed in order by Hispanics, whites, and Asian Pacific Islanders. Uh, that's McGee, Lau, Chow, and Cooper, 1990. Uh, these differences tend to be accentuated with increasing age. Uh, same citation. Uh, similar patterns exist for disability. Same citation again. Um, higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease has been reported among African Americans, African Americans, independent of the prevalence of APO, uh, APOE4 by some investigators, but not by others. Uh, Growing sophistication in descriptive epidemiology, particularly in relation to cardiovascular disease uh, and diabetes, has made it possible to uh, model the relationship between risk factors and subsequent disability and disease rates. Measurements of smoking habits, blood pressure, and cholesterol in young adulthood has been shown to predict directly the quality of life and healthcare experience of persons over 65. In broad strokes, therefore, health among the elderly can link to be surveillance data on known exposures. Against this uh, increasingly well defined epidemiological background, we are observing growing inequality by social class and geographical region, as well as by race and ethnicity. Uh, thus, whilst coronary heart disease uh, has been declining at a rate of about 3% per year among whites nationwide. Uh, its um, mortality has been upward, uh, turned upward among blacks in Mississippi. Blacks in communities are located at the center of large cities have also experienced declining health. Life expectancy for black men in Atlanta, Baltimore, St. Louis, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, a couple of other cities was less than 60 years in 1992. So essentially this big pa passage says that all of these... Um, all of these sort of uh, major lifestyle diseases, which these are, goes, you know, that's what it's talking about when it's talking about uh, heart disease, when it's talking about lung disease and liver disease uh, and cancer. These are generally uh, lifestyle and age associated diseases. And basically, uh, the, you know, this is how we see the same thing with every other thing in, uh, we're in terms of race is at one end is Asians, the other end as blacks and whites are somewhere in the middle, usually on the Asian side. Um, and it's exactly what we would expect. Uh, did you have any thoughts, Lawrence? Well, it's interesting that a lot of those problems where blacks used to be better than, used to have better outcomes than whites were, they seem to be pre-welfare state, after welfare state differences like type two diabetes. And um, just as another note, as you said at the end, yes, all of this is entirely predictable if you understand sort of things like RK selection theory and the ideas of people like Rushton and Arthur Jensen. Yeah, exactly. It's um, like this should come as no surprise. And, you know, it, we've basically been hammering this point for 43 episodes <laughs> now. <laughs> um, uh, it's not like it's a difficult problem to solve. It's just you have to be willing to accept that there are differences between the groups. Um, and that's not to say there isn't issues with defining groups, uh, especially um, along taxonomic lines, but that's what I've got later on. But yeah, that's just... Uh, we What we have is this huge... Uh, what we have, like... Um, I, I, actually, I probably should pull up a couple of bits from all of the other uh, papers that you know I read through and all that, but all of them keep going. Like, these are from medical doctors so they're not geneticists they're not um they're not uh systemists they're not anyone who actually does like the really really in-depth nitty-gritty work uh, in the in these sort of areas you know mds generally have um they obviously have their specializations but they you know they're focused on one very particular area of those specializations which is keeping people alive uh but yeah the the this um, they always have to preface everything with, with they say is like literally it's like we're not racist but like here are these differences between the race and uh, there was, there was a, one of the papers I read through there was an interview they, they had an interview with a whole group of GPs uh, basically about how they go about diagnosing each individual group um, or how they go about diagnosing individuals and whether or not they take race into account and all of that and every, every single one of them is like yeah but you know I uh, 
I don't like I'm not a racist, but I, I look at you know, these, these different I look at these the, the race as a way to uh, be able to narrow down what the issues these people potentially have or whether they're high risk of various things. Actually, there was one memorable quote in there, uh, which was something along the lines of the doctor uh, basically told this um, African-American lady that she needed to lose weight uh, when she came to the doctor and told him that she wanted to gain weight. She was horribly obese. And, you know, she asked, he, uh, the doctor asked why, and she apparently replied because her boyfriend wants her to have a bigger booty. <laughs> so I can only imagine it's this, like, massive land whale of an African. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's not really too much more to discuss about that. So did you want to jump into your stuff, Lawrence? Or? Well, um, I think you've... You should probably do your bit before I do fallacies because to understand the fallacies, you might need to understand the, the underlying methodology first. So why, why don't you go ahead? Oh, that's fair enough. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, uh, the second section that I have is uh, essentially there's, there's an issue with... Um, there's an issue with a formal definition of race that I want to sort of try and describe and it doesn't mean that race isn't a thing it just means that uh, I'll, I'll start talking I'll, you, hopefully this will come across uh, I'm going to start with a quote from Mishina in 1970 who defines systematic biology uh, of which taxonomy is a part of um, systematic biology hereafter called syst simply systematics is a field that A. provides scientific names for organisms B. Describes them. C. Preserves collections of them. D. Provides classifications for the organisms. Uh, keys for their, their identification and data on the distributions. E. Investigates their evolutionary histories. And F. Considers the, their environmental adaptions. Uh, this is a field with a long history that in recent years has experienced not a notable uh, renaissance, principally with respects to theoretical content. Part of the theoretical material has to do with evolutionary areas, topics E and F uh, above. The rest relate especially to the problem of classification. Taxonomy is that part of systematics that is concerned with topics A to D. Um, and I'll come back to that quote in a bit because that's just sort of, I'm just trying to uh, give a br very broad definition of this particular area of science and biology in particular. Uh, so where do we get this desire to... Uh, to uh, categorize things from and this question really ties it actually sounds like it's a complete non sequitur between you know race and the question and that question but there is actually a link that i'm trying to that i will build to uh so heuristics which are we did an episode on uh are in essence shorthands shorthand solutions to problems uh you know that uh Maybe not every tiger is going to eat you, but probably most of them are, so you probably not, shouldn't check them out. You know, it's a heuristic. It's a shorthand for a long-form solution. You don't need to learn every tiger by their first name in order to know that they're probably going to eat, try and eat you. Uh, so we have this... Um, that's sort of like an evolutionary pressure to develop these shorthands, to develop heuristics. And, you know, later on, we sort of begin to formalise these into categories, and that was what uh, eventually became taxonomy. And this goes a very long way to explain why we have such strong desire to categorize everything we come across. And it also explains why we find it so frustrating when things don't fall into neat boxes. And because of that, we can be tempted to throw the whole thing out when we find they don't fit nicely. Um, and this is the crux of the leftist argument against race is because it's a spectrum, it is, uh, the lines are blurred at points and uh, therefore at those points where they're blurred we're too similar therefore we don't uh, therefore races don't exist the analogy that I like to use to describe this uh, is color you have a color spectrum uh, between whatever two colors you want green and blue blue and red whatever blue and red now at some point in time uh, blue goes into you know blue will we're only going to say there are two colors for this example blue becomes red at some point uh, but at the exact point where it does it like if you go half an animator one way half an animator the other way is it really more blue or more red it's like very difficult to describe well, of course it is more blue or red but like can you really call it like a half an animator is that really different like it's very difficult to you know put those into hard categories the important thing to remember though is that you know 420 nanometers is definitely blue and at uh, whatever 
wavelength, uh, <laughs> whatever wavelength uh, red is at, it's definitely red. Like there are, you know, those are definitely different. It's just in the middle, things get a bit blurred and where we put the line in that little mi middle bit can be kind of arbitrary, but it doesn't really matter because the rest, like the actual body of the two colors are definite. And, you know, we see that with genetics and skin color. Um, culture to a degree like especially inside of Europe uh, you know we we can define it but we can't neatly delimit it and that's the problem uh, that causes a big problem with relying purely on things such as gen genetics for taxonomy um, and an even bigger problem for systematics in general uh, the systematics don't forget had that two extra bits so you have this problem with defining race formally we we can uh, at least in taxonomic terms uh, and the problem gets bigger when you're talking about systematics because then you have things like retroviruses. Uh, a retrovirus is basically one to two, one to three percent of your DNA is retrovirus, and essentially it can pop out and enter your genome at any point in time. Like you could have new stuff added in. So if you want to do a purely like lineage, uh, genetic lineage sort of way of looking at at evolution and genetic inheritance then are you a virus like that, that doesn't it doesn't really work so obviously like, there are these this big conflux of issues and what's the solution now well, obviously race is real like we have like i said the blue and red exist the delimit between the two can have some stuff up in the air and you're always going to lose out especially since race is built up not of one spectrum if you want to keep the metaphor not of one spectrum but of many different spectrums uh so so it's, it's very difficult to defined formally and it's sort of those gaps in the formal definition is what the left likes to build on to uh, build on to basically say that therefore race isn't real um, and to be honest I don't really think we need a particularly formal definition of race uh, if the informal uh, categorization of us and them is fine it works it does the job um, Obviously, then you can make a whole nother the same all the same arguments about how do you define us and them and all that sort of stuff. But the important part is because it's informal, there aren't like hard and fast rules that you absolutely have to. Uh, like obviously, there'll always be hard rule. Like you know, four nineteen nanometers isn't going to be red. Um, so there will there obviously be things that are definitely one way or the other. But like it's these edge cases where things are blurry, and it's sort of just an understanding of keeping that edge blurry. Um, you know, long story short, we don't particularly need a textbook telling us exactly what race is for us to know what it is and to be able to use it as a concept. Um, ironically, uh, a sort of a nice offhand solution was actually given to us by uh, Ernst Mayer, who is who probably 90% uh, sure echoes, um, but he's responsible for the modern view of speciation uh, and also Gould. He was his, uh, he, uh, Gould did his PhD under him. <laughs> So, you know, not the best guy. But his uh, guidelines on determining subspecies, which are the only taxonomic unit below species uh, for non-microorganisms, uh, is actually pretty good for uh, defining race, uh, which is uh, basically if you have two populations, you mix them together, and you're able to separate them with 90% accuracy into their original populations, then you have a subspecies. Uh, and that works pretty damn well for race, I would say. Uh, what do you think, Lawrence? I think you're absolutely correct. And it is true that like the, there are blurry borders between these population groups. But, I mean, when you get right down to it, we all know that there are different races. We all intuitively recognise race. And even lefties, in order to, to propose something like affirmative action, you would have to accept that there exists such a thing as race. Because... Otherwise, you're giving a college preference or a job preference to nobody. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you're giving it to something yeah, that doesn't exactly. exist. <laughs> well, that, that's where they get the... Um, it's a cultural construct from. Yeah. That, that, that's why the whole idea of the cultural con construct exists, which is... So they can have their cake and eat it too. Yeah. Yeah, which is it literally... This thing does not exist, but because you think it does exist, it exists. Yeah. It's, it's sort <laughs> of circular logic, isn't it? Like if you, if, if you say that something's a social construct, 
you could say that everything is a social construct. And if everything's a social construct, it's a meaningless concept. Yeah, uh, it's... Uh, it, there are some fantastic trolling that you can do with the whole idea of a social construct, especially when it gets into, you know, the gender thing. Like, you know, I sexually identify... Or, or sexuality, I sexually identify as an attack helicopter. You know, is something that has to be accepted by the left because of the way that they've defined these these things. Because the only way that they can keep um, they can keep like race and uh, race and gender to be things that exist, but only when they're a bad thing for white men, is by calling them um, you know like the figments of the white man's imagination, essentially. Yeah. Well. Um you could go back to historical records and you could look at what colonial explorers and you could even go back before uh, white colonization to Africa. You could look at what the Arab colonizers of sub-Saharan Africa said. And they, and they wrote some pretty colorful descriptions of the, the people that they encountered. Uh, they were very much aware that race was real and that there was a difference between them and the people that they encountered in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, everybody knew that was different up until, um, well, really, the, the, really, it was Marxism was like the big, everyone is absolutely the same. Like, you know, there was the blank slate and all of that, but it was, um, even with the blank slate, there was kind of like an understanding that it's still us and them. I don't know if you've caught this, um, this interview, it's, uh, Jared Taylor and, um, what's his name? And when it comes to me, I'm going to feel like an idiot because he's a well-known person. Sam Dixon. I kept oh, okay, thinking yeah, Sam yeah. Francis. I I and no, no, it can't be him because he's dead. Okay, back to it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've caught the interview, uh, Jared Taylor, with Sam Francis. And in it, Sam Francis says, and, and he's a, a sort of guy in his, um, I don't know, 70s. And he said, like, back... Before the 19... I think he was talking about the 50s or something. And even back then in the Deep South, they were being told at school that all races were the same and that race essentially was a meaningless distinction. And this was in segregated schools in the Deep South. So it it kind of has been there for a while, this uh, blank slate cultural Marxist attitude. Yeah, well, the, the blank slate is obviously um, it's a little bit old, it's older than Marxism, but it's like it's the it was the it it was the you know the socialist movement that or the you know the communist movement that sort of uh, gave it real legs, like it actually turned it into a force, whereas you know before there was. It was there was sort of you know egalitarian and all that reared its ugly head in place all over the place, uh, you know notably um, England, and the even at that time there was still there was still just sort of an, like I said there was still an understanding of us and them, and yeah it's just kind of impressive how far we have. Well, fallen. you could actually go back to some of the early Marxists, including Marx himself, and they were pretty aware that race exists. Marx had. Uh, a, a few colourful things to say about uh, Africans. And uh, you could go to someone like Jack yes. London, um, who described himself as a socialist, and, and he basically said that, uh, you know, uh, what was he said? The white race is the salt of the earth. Now, if you just said that and asked, who, oh, well, who's that a quote by? People would say, oh, it's Hitler or something. But it was a, a lifelong socialist that said that. Yeah, yeah. Uh it's the thing is like we've changed so much, especially you know last fifty years of of just this cultural indoctrination to us. Everyone must be exactly the same, and uh, in order to do that, you know, uh, guess who has to suffer? It's the same story over and over again in every single country. Uh, well, every single country with white people in it. Anyway, um, that really covers my bit. That's sort of a. It was like a very description of one particular area where this sort of uh where the left can act actually has like a bit of room to dig their claws in a bit and why it's not really 
or why their argument isn't really valid. That was that was my second part. Um, did you want to move on to the the more um, common fallacies? I'm assuming you've you've covered the you you've covered them like the the everyday sort of fallacies that you see with race all over the place. Yeah, I've got the the main ones. Uh, yeah, did you sure. Want to go well, uh, it's good. You, I think you've laid a good groundwork for going into this uh, section. Um, yeah, like uh, some of it you've you've mentioned, so I might expand a bit on that or just uh, revise it. The first fallacy is that you know the obvious one: there's no such thing as race; doesn't exist. Meaningless to talk about it, and that's probably the one that you're going to get the most. Um, I'm I'm sure everyone's come across this before, and. When you look at it, what it really is, is it's a dispute over terminology. And they're very tedious arguments to get into. Like, who, who likes semantic arguments? Nobody. They're boring. So to answer this, we'll, we'll need to actually define what we mean by race. And the definition that people like Rushton or Levin and others use is that race is defined by place of ancestry. So as a bit of background, we know that Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa and into Europe about 110,000 years ago. And about 70,000 years later, a branch of that population migrated into Asia. So if we take 25 years as a generation, you could say that a Negroid is someone whose ancestors were born in sub-Saharan Africa between about 40 and 4,400 generations ago. And likewise, a Caucasoid would be someone whose ancestors came from Europe and a Mongoloid is someone whose ancestors came from Asia. And since African-Americans have about 25% white admixture, you could define an American Negroid as someone who has 75% of his ancestors from sub-Saharan Africa between 40 and 4,400 generations removed. So this is the definition that I think a lot of people have in mind, even unconsciously when they use the term race, like in just common parlance. But you can have a verbal dispute over the word race, but you can't really say that you don't have ancestors and that those, those ancestors didn't come from a certain geographical region. And they reside in that geographical region because of the migration patterns out of Africa. So... That, that is what I think is a good definition of race. I, I consider it an ancestral geographical thing. And if you want, you can delve into the genetics. And the genetics, when people do that, it turns out to correlate pretty well with people's self-identity of race. Because everyone knows that they've got like black or white or whatever grandparents. So they, they, they know kind of where they come from. So the second fallacy and... Yeah, I've, I've come across this a bit. There's no gene in one population that no other population has. There's no exclusive Negroid gene, no exclusive European gene, no exclusive East Asian gene or whatever. Like, there's no gene that they have that no other population group has. But what there are are different allele frequencies between these population groups. And that... You know, when you take a when you take frequencies into account, you can end up with a lot of variation. To demand that there's got to be one gene that some population group has that none of the other has is just putting too high a standard on the definition. I mean, it's it's defining it out of existence. Divergent combinations of the same genes might diverge in their expression and produce different mean phenotypic differences. So the next fallacy, yeah, oh, do you mind sure, if I just touch ahead, on that yeah. one just quickly? Um, I've mentioned this a couple of times on previous shows, but like there, so uh, the the distribution of um, like haplotypes uh, is saying like, it's, like you said, that's where we build ancestry from. Uh, to give an example of this being used extremely poorly, uh, a few years ago um, they tested what was apparently uh, Hitler's DNA. Yeah, that was they, they got it from a museum in Russia uh, whether it was or wasn't um, doesn't really it doesn't really matter for this but uh, essentially um, what they found was that he had the haplo uh, haplo group h1b1b1 uh, which is anywhere from uh, present you know through Morocco through the Middle East and up until Germany 
uh, it's also shared by Ashkenazi Jews. And so, of course, the media ran with all these stories. Hitler was Jewish. He had this haplo, he had this haplotype that was, you know, uh, that the Ashkenazi Jews have. Therefore, he must have been Jewish. But no, it's like you have, oh, just having, just knowing that one as a single data point doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, it's this, com- you have to actually look at the combination of, you know, every single one and like where those on average put you. And that's how you build up. Uh, that's actually how you build up your ancestry from genetics. It's not like a single point. Yeah, it's a common um, thing that people do is they look at one singular data point. Like, let's say we're categorizing things according to lots of different variables. And then we say, oh, okay, uh, we'll categorize things that live in the ocean. You could say, oh, well, therefore, a whale is a fish because it lives in the ocean. But no, a whale's a mammal. So you can't just look at one data. You can't just look at one variable. You've got to look at a cluster of things. And that is what taxonomy does. Looks at many things. Yeah, it's like, but but fishes live in the ocean, therefore whales must be fish. It's something that doesn't, you know, we obviously understand that, that, or anyone who knows that whales are in fact not fish (laughs) will understand that that is, you know, does does not, um, it is not correct. Even on the face of it, just because something is, you know, just because A is part, of, uh, A does B does not mean that everything does B does is is A. Um, and yeah, this is something that's the, uh, like you know, there are some of the um, crazier <laughs> parts of the right which does similar things, uh, but by and large, like you know, this is this is something that just people do when they've got a concept in their head that they cannot get rid of, and so they find any bit of evidence that they have to sort of, you know, sh- to show that this thing is the case. And then, then so they will find this one little one little bit and they'll latch onto it. And you often see the left do that with skin colour. They're always blurred out skin colour, uh, you know, all the time. And in researching for this episode, I came across this um, podcast. It's called Science Versus Podcast Ask, Asks, Does Race Exist? And it's from the ABC, which is the government-run um you know, TV and radio um, enterprise in Australia. And it's, as you can probably guess, it's pretty fucking terrible. It's <laughs> head to toe full of commies. But anyway, it had this uh, episode saying that, you know, race doesn't exist, blah, blah, blah. And they cited this experiment where they got someone's skin color and then looked to see if their DNA, like, correlated with their skin color. And they found, well, it doesn't correlate perfectly, therefore race is meaningless. But, I mean, no one really classifies based on skin color. Like, for instance, Indians, that is, you know, the Indians from India, they have brown skin that is the same color as sub-Saharan Africans. But you never mistake an Indian for an African. Yeah, and they've, they've got a completely different geographic location and, and that would show up on a genetic test. So no one actually defines race by skin color. There are light skinned. I mean, you know, like uh, Arabs, they're like part of the sort of Caucasian group. And some of them have light skin. Some North Africans have light skin. And the uh, Brahmin Indians. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But um, even like even just going off skin color, like it should be obvious that it won't won't be a one to one thing because it's phenotype. Phenotype is a combination of genetics and environment. Someone who is, uh, you know, indoors for all hours of the day every day is going to have a lighter skin tone than on you know than someone who doesn't, mm. uh, given the same genetics. Now then uh, maybe exceptions for like the very very pale and the very very dark but like in the when you talk in the in-between colors like they're going to be you know there's going to be a noticeable difference like people tan for a reason yeah uh, so it should actually even even that should just be obvious that it's bullshit because mm. like the left like to say oh what's white you know is this white is that white is someone from the north of turkey white is someone from the south of greece white I like to, I prefer European. European cuts through a lot of that clutter because we know what Europe is. Sure, you could say is Eastern Europe, Europe, you know, yeah, you could you could get you could split hairs if you wanted to, but you know, yeah. European well, people and and their descendants that came to places like, you know, North America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc. 
yeah you fall into definition wars when you do that though um unfortunately uh because then, you know, they'll try and always find land to break Yeah, like it. is Turkey, you know, Europe down. is, you know, Romania, yeah. um, Europe, are the Armenians, uh, European. Yeah, I, but there's no escaping it, really, but... Well, yeah, the, the good response to it is, well, how do you know who has white privilege? Yeah. You know? Um, okay, so if I have white privilege, I must I must be white. Like, that. that's kind of by definition. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, you have a way to determine whether or not I'm white because... You need to determine whether or not I have privilege. I think most of the people that bring up these, like, points, you know, they're just being nitpickers. Like, when you say white, everyone knows what you mean. They, they, they don't think you mean someone from sub-Saharan Africa whose ancestors came from sub-Saharan Africa going back <laughs> since the time that Homo sapiens migrated yeah, out of Africa. Like, we all, we all know what it is, and people just like to nitpick and go, uh, you can't have this, can't have that. It's... It's because they've got a... Um, there's a couple of reasons why they do it. Like, one of them is, you know, they're not used to... <laughs> they're not used to arguing with people who actually have opinions that aren't identical to theirs. Um, and so they don't have any real argumentation f- against it. Um, and so they result... They, uh, they devolve into just, uh, like, trying to break down every single point to keep the conversation that bogged down that it never progresses, um, which is fairly common. And the other group are the people who actually think it's some kind of gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just like, no. <laughs> like, you obviously define these things. So, uh, you are, you know, as you, like, if hypothetically, you know, race didn't exist, you are just as wrong as me because you have this thing called white privilege. Like, you have this concept called white privilege, uh, which you then assign to people who you define as white. Like, it's... <laughs> Yeah, but they'll say that, you know, they mean white in terms of a social construct. So, you know, it's the, it's, it's their having a cake and eating it thing again. Yeah, well, okay, so it's a social construct, but how is that social construct determined? It's determined by your phenotype. Mm-hmm. Okay, where does that, where does that phenotype come from? Uh, the definition of phenotype, like, <laughs> you can draw it back. But yeah, it's, you, you fall, if the, that sort of thing obviously falls into that argument uh, that that sort of definition bitch fight which is not I like fun. that where does it come from I might uh, I'll have to remember that if they say social construct yeah. where does the social construct come from it's a good point oh thank you anyway um I've interrupted you enough do you want oh, to no, that's just good. I, I think the... that's good um yeah oh, I have I have more but uh I don't mind if you interrupt because um yeah it keeps things going okay so where am I? Yeah, okay. So you can... Another fallacy is that... And I think this is something we might have just touched on. You can group people by any number of characteristics. This will sort of be their comeback to like when you sort of talk about genetics or, or any other sort of traits that you cluster into a certain category. They'll say, well, you can group people by any ca- characteristic. Like you could classify people according to their fingerprint patterns or their ability to digest lactose or any other trait their skill at basketball 100 meter sprint swimming whatever but that miss i'm fine with separating people into their ability to digest lactose and their skill at basketball yeah i'm fine with that (laughs) but uh the thing is that it sort of misses the point of categorizing things in the first place it's it's a matter of empirical fact if the criteria correlate with further independently specified traits rather than the human choice that went into it. For example, can you say that there is a right or a a wrong way to categorize land regions? So you could use anything from height above sea level or rainfall, temperature, the flora and fauna that are present in an area. But once that category is established... I'm talking about like desert, rainfall, that sort of thing, tundra. But once you have that category, the correlation of that variable with other things such as crop yield would become an objective question. So, yeah, it's is the category useful? You find it is and it correlates with other variables. Yeah, well, that's the whole point of categorizing things is that, like, like I touched on before, be, uh, what you're doing is you're essentially like formalizing her, a heuristic. 
something that we do passively. What you're doing is saying, okay, so these things are in these categories. And typically, maybe not always, but typically they have the sets of behaviors, be that levels of aggressiveness or friendliness or how well you get on with them, how much you like them, whatever. They, they can even be arbitrary. But what the thing with race is we've got a way to do it, which everyone can use, like an entire social group, an entire people can uh, each use and get the same understanding. So it's like you can't have a um, conversation with someone unless you share definitions. So it's kind of like it's like sharing. It's like sh- the, the whole idea of taxonomy is like sharing those heuristics. Yes. And, and yeah, that's something that's exploited by people who, who are race deniers and, and they want to get into these verbal disputes. Like, what do you mean by race? Does this count? Does that count? When it, when it is like something that we all intuitively understand. I mean, you know, you could look at something like taxonomy and there are big disputes constantly going on all the time about what organize, organisms should be classified as. And sometimes they change their classification. There's disputes over whether viruses are alive or not. They're on the borderline. Are they alive or sort of? Are they not alive? Yeah, also sort of. You know, there's always conflict like that going on that doesn't mean that virus as a category doesn't exist and that having that category (laughs) having that framework is highly useful for doing things like medical science well don't you know hiv doesn't exist um but that 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 concept of uh, alive is actually something that's really good a really good point to bring up because we change the definition of it like the definition of it is, is kind of changed a few times in different groups of like this is amongst uh, biologists has changed amongst different groups a bit um, because well they were trying to they basically whether or not the group wanted to let viruses into the alive category or not it's it's the kind of like it's the opposite it's instead of like the definitions determining the categories the categories are determining the definition yeah um, and that's kind of um very similar to what what uh what people do like there's there's nothing inherently wrong with that because you still get the same uh it's kind of like saying um here is utility that i want and so thus we must have this definition uh as opposed to here are the categories and then we get the def uh, that th- uh, here are the categories then we get the utility from it it's like neither is neither is wrong but they are it's um saying it's just something to think about and keep in mind and you know like, like you said just because it's uh maybe alive maybe not alive depending on how you want to define things but um it's definitely you know an obligate obligate intercellular parasite yeah i think i think um another side of it is people are just uncomfortable with the word race it's associated with a lot of things it's associated with Nazis, crimes and atrocities, the KKK, you know, lots of other things that happened in history. But I mean, all, all of that is, is, is highly unfortunate. But, you know, does that determine whether something's true or not? I mean, if a bad person brushes his teeth, does that make brushing your teeth bad? Yeah, <laughs> uh, just because something is, yeah, it's just because something exists, like the existence of something is not inherently good or yeah. bad it is but yeah like um you know if you don't like the word race you can say population group it really doesn't matter what you call it you can call it x y and z if you want you can call it red green well, and blue the, like the, the, the word isn't what's important it's what you're actually representing with that word that's important and the left don't really like the word race so that's why they attack it with such intensity and sometimes they trip themselves up they say you read, you read these screeds about how race doesn't exist, and they go, yeah, sure, we agree that there are certain geographically distinct population groups, but that doesn't mean there's such a thing as race. Uh, a geographically distinct population group is a race. And you can call it whatever. You yeah. can call it Bob, John, and Steve, <laughs> or, or whatever you want. It's, it's the same yeah, thing. That was literally what I was about to say was um, a lot of the, the big push in, like, uh, clinical uh like clinical medicine in terms of race is to sort of uh is to stop using race as a concept because it has all of these uh is has all of these sort of um, inaccuracies and inefficiencies and to instead use uh geographical origin 
Yeah. I mean, to, it's to, to me, thing. it doesn't really matter what it's called. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. I'm not really fixated on the word yeah. race as opposed to other things. So, I mean, I don't care if people want to discuss it but not say race and want to call it something else. It doesn't bother me. Yeah, I'm not really concerned with the word in itself. Yeah, it's it's well, it has utility as a, uh, a good way to troll people, to piss off people. Yeah, that's true. Other, other than that, like you can you can just like yeah, like I said, it doesn't matter. It, it is what it is. You can call you can you can call viruses a, a I don't know a bloody coin, whatever. Like any word you want, just because you change the word. Um, the word describing the definition doesn't mean that the definition doesn't exist. Well, the left are very big on words and having words and not having other words and changing the definition of words. So it's it's something that's more important to them than it is to us, I think. Control, yeah, control um, the language and, you know, you control people's minds. Yeah, a lot of that are things like per, uh, persuasive redefinition, which is something else, uh, which is really shitty. Um Okay, so the quick, the quick and nasty of persuasive def, def, uh, redefinition is essentially, I call Lawrence a pedophile. And I don't mean like pedophiles and someone who molests children. I mean pedophile as in someone <laughs> who likes eating. <laughs> that, that's how I define pedophile. But then, so then, you, if you hypothetically would accept that, uh, then you know, pedophile still has this association that we have. So Lawrence is a pedophile means that it doesn't. People don't think that it means that Lawrence likes eating. It means that Lawrence likes fiddling kids. <laughs> no offense, man. <laughs> this is the first thing off the top of my head. Um, but that, that's what they do with these word games that they play. And so that's something to be really cautious about. Like, uh, that's, that's probably the best reason to not accept um, these definition changes. Because, you know, they, they, um, they do these, these things. They essentially mess with the kind of the way you perceive the world. But other than that, like, it has no real, like, uh, other than, you know, the left screwing with us like that, um, it doesn't, like, the actual definition of the word doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, Other than true. the implications that we yeah. have. Could have used a different example, though, to illustrate that, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, okay, so the thing is with persuasive redefinition, uh, like, the pedophile, the word pedophile is, like, the com for some reason, everything I've read about it is, like, that is the commonly used example. And that was the first name. I, yours was the first name I thought of. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So sorry about that. But anyway. Okay. So moving right along. Okay. There's another objection, and this is one that you'll probably come across. Defining race by ancestral population. That's all well and good. Um, but when they're, you know, what is the actual difference in terms of genetic material between these population groups it turns out it is 0.0012 percent and people will say well that genetic difference is so small the differences must be insignificant but the problem with that argument is that the raw number in itself doesn't really mean anything humans and chimpanzees share 98.5 percent of their genes but that it would be absurd to say that humans and chimps the difference between humans and chimps is meaningless and small differences can have a large effect what was the genetic difference between mozart and some guy on the street of vienna probably not much probably less than 0.0012 percent but that doesn't mean that they that the differences between those people were meaningless so there's no reason why you why you would pick that small number 0.0012% and on an a priori a prioriistic basis say well it must be meaningless. I mean you could think about it in terms of disease like there are diseases where you knock out one base pair and you're paralyzed, you're blind, you can't breathe, you can't walk like that's a major difference. And what is the difference between that person genetically and someone else? Well, it's a lot less than 0.0012%. It's the differences that matter. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a better way, a good way to look at it is um, kind of think, and low blank slate, but think of like uh, Luca, our last universal common ancestor for humans. Um, like, you know, before we separated off into, you know, the group that went into 
uh, Europe and then they separate all that. But all like all the way back when we were shared ancestors with Africans. If you want to look at that as like the uh, as the blank slate for this example, like is the, that's what you start with. That's your starting material, and then there's separation and a hundred or thousand years of you know evolution uh, between these two between the, between the groups now, and what you you know you wouldn't expect it to be completely different they're both built from that same sort of canvas and it's the differences that are the important part like there's there's nothing like it just because we uh just because it shares the same base material doesn't mean that there's no differences it's like saying that every painting every oil painting is exactly the same because they use oil paint yeah exactly I mean, it's some, I can't remember off the top of my head, something like 60% of your DNA is the same as a watermelon. Because, like, when you get right yeah, down it's, to it's, it, it's, proteins are proteins. Um, you know, like, even if you're just talking about, like, humans and chimps, I mean, muscle, tissue, hair, skin, eyes. I mean, all the tissue is pretty much the same. The organ functions are pretty much the same. I mean, na- nature's Back pretty to- conservative. It doesn't waste DNA when it doesn't have to. It'll just reuse it. Bacteria, uh, which is the, you know, the fur- like, you know, when you think about it, the furthest away from us that you can really get, or, you know, we're talking microorganisms, but like, just bacteria, single cellular bacteria, you know, E. coli, Staphylococcus, um, Staphylococcus epidermis, your skin's covered in um, golden stuff. Uh, as far as like their their metabolic processes, now they have a lot of extra stuff tacked on because of uh, essentially harsh evolutionary pressures. That uh, evolutionary pressures are especially harsh against um, single cellular organisms um, for obvious reasons. There's only one reproducing unit, um, uh, but uh, what you and like mutations obviously have a bigger effect because you know only one cell. Uh, but what you find is all of the basic stuff um, that we have in our metabolic uh, in our metabolic process, the process of breaking down like glu- especially like you know glucose into uh, ATP, um, it's the same. Um, there are things tacked on like you know f- uh, fermentation. We also have like uh, uh, lactose fermentation in our muscles, but um, you know uh, other than like these other than these extra things that that some bacteria have that a lot of bacteria have um is the fundamentals of it are exactly the same we have the same uh, we use the same nucleotides uh we produce many of the same proteins like the v- very simple ones to do uh we have the exact same um fundamental basis of a cell wall which is you know uh lipids again bacteria have more stuff because of subsequent evolutionary pressures but you know we've got all these things which are very very similar um obviously black bacteria don't have a nucleus but you know there's other things going on there but they've got uh they've got dna which is functionally identical to ours and um some some of the material some of the mechanisms that they have to that goes into reproducing a little bit that goes into reproducing are a bit different to ours but um you know overall like these things are very very similar and so like yeah like where we're very like to to say that it's just this does not make sense to say that just because we're so similar to something means that we are uh that we are no different from it like it's the, at those point it's the differences that matter you know we are very different from bacteria no one is going to say that we're the same as bacteria but we have all of these stuff in common and going by their logic we must be identical there is a high degree of similarity in the dna between men and women i mean i don't have the figure off the top of my head but it is very similar it's closer than 98.5 which is humans and chimps and you know it's obvious that there are huge differences between men and women although the left is on a kick of saying men and that those are social constructs and don't really exist but people that have two brain cells to rub together realize that that's a load of nonsense the nice thing about like social con like the word social construct if you take like any leftist spiel you can pretty much just you know control replace (laughs) social construct with genetic (laughs) and um what they're saying like other than the conclusions of course but you know what they're saying wouldn't actually be that wrong (laughs) yeah it's just a, it's just a one-to-one substitute anyway. 
um did you have more that you want to yeah i've got the, i've got the last thing and it's probably the best bit it's um lewontin's fallacy and this is a classic one um which is is closely related to the last one that i just talked about and you'll probably see it come up at some point if you discuss this sort of stuff with people and it states that there is more genetic like the formal sort of declaration of it there's more genetic diversity within races than between them I'm sure you've sort of heard that. Now, it takes a little bit to wrap your head around it, but what they're saying, well, it comes from a guy named Richard Lewontin, and he did a study in 1972, and he found that of the 0.01% of DNA that varies between individuals, 85% of it is found within population groups, and 8.3% was found between them. So there's more diversity within groups than between groups. Now, a guy named A.W. Edwards countered this in a 2003 paper, and he pointed out that Lewontin is right when you look at individual locations on the genome, but you can classify with near 100% accuracy when you look, instead of just look at individual locations, when you look at frequencies of alleles at different locations on the genome. And he said, quote, Most of the information that distinguishes populations is hidden in the correlation structure of the data. And, you know, basically you can tease that out if you use something like cluster analysis, which will, you know, show these groups up as identifiable groups. And also um, Richard Dawkins in The Ancestor's Tale, he said, Quote, however small the racial partition of the total variation may be, if such racial characteristics as there are highly correlate with other racial characteristics, they are by definition informative and therefore of taxonomic significance. So, yeah, that's kind of elaborating on what we've just talked about. I mean, you can say, oh, well, look at this small number, therefore it's meaningless, but it's not really the size of the number. It's not really the difference in like one singular location on the genome it's a cluster of things and you know even if it is a small number that small number can be important yeah so um, i mean just been, one one no. bit i mean when you're looking at that it's it, it, the reason it's sort of hard to talk about because it's kind of hard to get your head around but with that like more difference within group and between group to, to use an analogy there is more the, the tallest woman, the, there are some women that are tall, like taller than some men, and the tallest woman is taller than the, like the shortest man. But so there's more like variation in height, but within women than between women and men. But that doesn't mean that there's no average difference in height between women and men. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's a really good analogy for it. Like it's. Um, you you have separate bell curves and just because like the intermingled part may be you know all the like, difference between those two peaks may be uh, maybe quite narrow doesn't mean that there aren't different peaks or mm. different well, there's actually a lot of genetic diversity within dogs like you know how there's all those all different breeds of dogs there's a huge amount of yep. genetic diversity within the species of dog compared and there's more diversity there than there is between dogs and say giraffes but that doesn't mean that you know dogs and giraffes are exactly the same and the differences are meaningless yeah because it's like you say it's something that's very difficult to uh to get your head around just because it's it's the sort of thing that you know it's like um like uh you get maths problems that do the same sort of thing where you just sort of all like you know chess problems or go problems if you look at those we just sort of you're basically you're just staring at you know a description of it and eventually it'll just pop into your head like an understanding of it um and if you're like me you'll just go away immediately but um but yeah it's kind of like it's 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 a difficult concept to actually uh grasp but i did i did think that your um height analogy is actually quite good there yeah you, you are right and, and i think it's it's like you know the sort of the statement that more genetic diversity within than between i mean it requires a bit of wrapping your head around the concept 
And that's why it can be a very impressive argument to people because it does come from a very highly respected biologist. Richard Lewontin invented Western blotting, which is a, a, a staple technique of uh, molecular biology. So it comes from a very highly respected um, biologist and it sounds very impressive, but it actually really isn't. I mean, it, it's... Yeah, I explained what's wrong with it, but uh, yeah, it, it is it is impressive on the face of it. I will give it that. Yeah, like as uh, they said, it's one of the um, that's one of the more common arguments that the left uses, and it's the problem with it is that it's very difficult to get across why they're wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's um, I didn't really have much more to add to that. Yeah, well, that's that's uh, all that I've got. Covered so, quite well. Yeah. All right, I will. I think we'll probably uh, wrap up there. If you noticed, uh, Kathy hasn't joined us this week because um, she is doing Kathy things. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fine anyway. Um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, next week um, we had a request from uh, we had a request from How Abbott. Uh, yes, I think I may be wrong to do uh, differences between Aboriginals, or to do a show on Aboriginals, uh, which I think would be a good idea to expand into a show on the more interesting uh, the, the the groups that are widely considered uh, that are considered human, but only only just, uh, which include Aboriginals, uh, the, I think it's the Batal tribe, uh, with the, they're the ones with the huge booties <laughs> um and uh, a couple of others that we might be able to dig up. Uh, this has been the Darwin Digest, episode 43, where we have been discussing race once again. Bye.